the Backyard Astronomer's Guide credits Alan Egler with having, quote, introduced more innovations in telescope eyepiece designs than anyone else in the history of amateur astronomy. And that's just one of the uh, things that he's proud of and that we recognize him for. Please welcome our guest speaker for tonight, Al Nagler. Suddenly a police car comes by. He said, 
Stop, he says, my God, are you lucky? We thought you were a bear. <laughs> so, that, 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 was my, that was my first, uh, first close call. In any case, uh, when I got out of high school, I wrote an article on how I built this telescope for Mechanics Illustrated magazine. Any of you remember Mechanics Illustrated? It appeared in 1955, so this is the 50th anniversary of that particular article. Now, uh, with that article in hand, I happened to know that a fellow who worked at the Ferrand Optical Company, who was the chief project engineer there, uh, his name was Earl Brown, and he also was the Gleanings for ATM editor at Sky and Telescope. This is a guy in, in the Bronx, and a company in the Bronx. So I um, eventually worked my way there, and uh, when I showed him the article in Mechanics Illustrated, he said, eh, telescope, not okay, we'll try him out. Uh, so I became a draftsman there, and a year later they invited me to join the optical design department where I worked on a lot of interesting projects, including the first uh, eyepieces for the night vision goggles made by IT&T. So here I was in, locally in a, in a research environment of a lot of great guys, and, and that, that's where I learned my optics on the job. I, I did get a physics degree at night, but, but the optics I all learned on the job. So at any rate, it all started from building that telescope. Well, that's a closer view of the instrument in uh, 1958. I got an award in Stellafane uh, for that and uh, learned to do some more machining and a couple of other things, but that's what it looked like circa 1958, 59, something like that. And, uh, well, maybe we have too much of an angle here. Uh, well, let's go back. Let's see what happens. Okay, learn one more. Um, well, may, how many of you have been to Stellafane? Great. Well, you know, Stellafane is the place where amateur telescope making started in the United States because a lot of precision machinists in that area. And so I've been going up to Stellafane uh, since, the, since about 1955. And I would just live to get up to Stellafane. Well, I sort of still do, I have to admit it. <laughs> it's still great fun. And a couple of years ago, um, at Stellafane, I commissioned a fellow amateur astronomer who was an artist and tel telescope maker um, named uh, Fleming to do a family portrait. You recognize me with the telescope. That's my wife, Judy. Judy, where are you? Judy? Please say hello to my wife. I never give her credit, and she deserves all the credit in the world. So tonight, tonight she's with me. Anyway, and then there's uh, my daughter and her husband, my son David and Sandy. David has been in the company now for 16 years, and he's uh, kind of following, hopefully, my footsteps. That's, that's what Stellafane looks like with the clubhouse and the Porter Tower Telescope. So I thought I'd show you a few pictures at Stellafane uh, over the years that I've taken. I've had a lot of fun at Stellafane, and uh, they're always, oh, well, before we get there, that's me in about 1960. I just wanted to show you that I did once have hair. <laughs> but that's the 12-inch telescope. Uh, I converted the 8-inch into a 12-inch when I found a mirror very inexpensively, 12-inch mirror, and I re repolished it and made it a 12-inch scope. And there's Judy! Hi, dear. <laughs> and, and then I went a little further uh, with that scope, and you see all the gizmos in there, and I was into astrophotography, and uh, I got another award in 1972, I think it is. So, that, again, is uh, Stella Fang. Now, Stellafane, you don't necessarily have to have fancy telescopes to show it's Stellafane. You can enter anything in the world uh, to get a prize. Uh, it's nice to get a prize for a nice telescope you made, but people have no fear at, at, at Stellafane. And this is a crazy hobby, you all know it, so you might as well have fun with it. 
So that's, that's one instrument. It's a particular favorite <laughs> instrument of mine. Uh, early pipe fitting uh, Dobsonian. Um, uh, here's one, one of the biggest telescopes I've ever seen. In fact, you can see how big it is by the man who's walking up the back end of it. <laughs> so, so the, the big telescopes, small telescopes, everything goes at Stellafane and the clubhouse. So if you haven't gone there, take a break one year and go up there and, and, and see the history. God only knows what this is. <laughs> but I, I found it on the hill, and so naturally I had to take a picture of it one year. I, I never bothered to try to figure it out. There's got to be some optics in there someplace. <laughs> um, I'm sorry this is a little dull photo, but if you look closely, you can see one of this is one of the first radio telescopes. This fellow built a telescope into an old radio. I don't know if you can see the dial there on the side. Uh, on the side, but uh, <laughs> so you can make this, make this look brighter. No, it's on the back. Okay. So anyway, early radio telescope. <laughs> I must admit this was the pits, <laughs> but but I I couldn't resist. It was a working instrument. <laughs> Um, here's, another, here's another very nice, beautiful uh, refracting telescope, kind of Springfield type with a interesting uh, structure that the fellow can uh, you know, well shield it from the elements. And of course, uh, some people uh, uh, confuse that instrument with other things. <laughs> Typical uh, cellophane uh, activity, uh, roughing it there. So. But there are really spectacular and beautiful telescopes that have changed the nature of the amateur telescope making, shown in Stelfin. This is a gorgeous one. Uh, the first, uh, you see what came later when they call it a miniature version of this in red. But this is a 12-inch reflector, which is just beautiful. fellow loaded the mirror from the top. Uh, this is a famous uh, turret telescope at the Hartness house. Uh, Governor Hartness was an amateur astronomer in, in Vermont and he built and there's a fabulous museum here of uh, Russell Porter's memorabilia and this is the 10 inch refractor that he built. So it looks like the, the old woman in the shoe, you know, kind of thing. But it's a wonderful instrument and the fellow holding it there is my dear departed friend Alan Green who uh, founded the NEAF event at the Rockland Astronomy Club. I, I, I've seen a lot of great people and have made great friends over the years. This, of course, is a Roger Tuthill. Many of you probably uh, know uh, Roger. Uh, that's my son, David. Uh, David is now president of Teleview. I'm just the CEO. But this, I'd like you all to meet the president of Teleview. Yosemite Sam. Okay. And, and then here he's being, a couple of years uh, down the road, being greeted by Governor Johnson of Vermont. So it's, it's quite a historic place, though, and that's why it means a lot to me. There's David uh, currently uh, with uh, Sandy, uh, his wife, who's um, office manager and vice president of uh, Teleview, and uh, Mr. Fleming, the artist. Uh, at a more recent television. You all recognize this gentleman, famous uh, John Dobson, um, and Walter Scott Houston, wonderful, wonderful man I had a lot of arguments with. This, uh, it, the fellow facing us it is not a terrorist. The fellow facing us is David Levy, okay? And he's wearing that blue shirt because he published a faux magazine called Smog and Telescope, which if you've ever seen it years ago, was just a wonderful uh, goof. That's uh, David Levy. Uh, this is my high school shop teacher. My high school shop teacher and his wife. Uh, about 15 years ago, he gave me a call out of the blue. 
he was recuperating from an operation and somebody gave him a sky and telescope and he saw this picture of me, if you remember, and Ed, we had inside a bottle. It says, a little nail that goes into every Teleview bottle. And a little picture of me in, on top of the bottle. So he saw that, called me up, we became fast friends um, after a lapse of 30 years or so. And I, I, I gave him one of our brass telescopes. And he, is, he was instrumental in helping us. And of course, his Clyde Tombo was at uh, Stella Fane uh, one year. So that's kind of my, my Stella Fane adventures. Well, anyway, um, working at Ferrand as an amateur astronomer, I had a number of unique experiences, but there was, there was nothing like getting involved in the space program. Luckily, uh, somebody at the company came up with a concept of what's called an infinity display, which projected um, infinity images of the sky and the Earth and docking and everything else uh, to the astronauts and that enabled us to uh, really uh, train the astronauts as well as possible in, in space. Now, this is a picture I took at uh, Long Island. In fact, I just saw, I was at the Air and Space Museum today and I can't believe how wonderful that place is. Just, just fantastic. And I saw all the wonderful memorabilia. It brought a lot of, uh, a lot of memories back. But anyway, th this is the start of a little talk I give called giant eyepieces that swallow spacecraft. Because some people think I build really big eyepieces, but you ain't seen nothing yet. This is a picture of the LEM, inside the LEM, and you see LEM has a triangular window, and the trick is to present a field of view to the astronaut so he could see all of this. Well, if you take this simulator, and give it a set of specifications that corresponds to an eyepiece, the field of view is 110 degrees. The eye relief is three feet, and the exit pupil is one foot. <laughs> now that's a big eyepiece. So I don't want to hear any guff from you guys in the future. This is a picture of the simulator. That's the white part where they, they go in the structure and you see a different structure uh, around it. And I'll show you a little bit about what actually goes on in there. Uh, that's the part of the simulator that butts up against the triangular window of the lens. There's a 30 inch lens there, the shape of the window that was part of the simulator. And inside we used mirrors and lenses, some of the mirrors were as large as seven feet in diameter. Uh, the principle of that is very simple. If you take a spherical mirror, you know you have a focal surface that's a sphere that's half the radius, right? And uh, if you project out from that sphere, you'll get infinity over a tremendous angle, and that's wonderful. So if you can imagine a television set or a spherical ball filled with stars, little ball bearings, placed at the focus of the spherical mirror, you get this incredible field of view and uh, projected to infinity. There's one slight detail. The television sets in the way of your eyes. So to fix that, we add a beam splitter and move the focal surface away out of the path so the observer looks at the infinity view through this virtual focal surface. And this is a diagram, I don't know how well you can see it, but we'll I'll try to point out a few things uh, just uh, briefly. That's the lens in front of the pupil. Here's, here's where the astronaut sits. Here's the first beam splitter, first 80 inch mirror. So now you have a television tube, and whatever is put on the television tube gets projected to this infinity view over 110 degrees. You also have a celestial sphere, a black three-foot ball with a thousand ball bearings embedded in it that correspond to the size, the, the magnitude of, and the constellations, a thousand stars. In fact, once they did this, they stopped training at the planetarium in Virginia. 
Uh, and uh, in any case, th that was the heart of this uh, system, which used all these big mirrors. And the systems for Rand developed. Uh, I did the one for the Lem and the Gemini, and other people did the Apollo. If you've seen the movie Apollo 13, you've seen uh, some of the simulators, big brown structures and so on. The astronauts affectionately called the simulators the great train wreck because that's really just about what they look like from the outside. Uh, this is a um, picture of the star ball, a three-foot black ball that can move and pitch roll when you are. The focal plane sort of presents at infinity, this 110-degree view. You notice uh, Orion here. And you notice the three stars in the belt aren't exactly even. Well, as an amateur astronomer, I noticed that, and I called, it, I called attention to that to the engineers. I said, you know, something's wrong here. And they checked into it, and they found that one of the stars is a navigational star and was uh, plotted uh, circa 1965, and the other ones were, uh, they took from an atlas from 1940 or 1950. So due to uh, precession of the, e of the equinoxes, there's a, there's a little variation. So stuff happens. Uh, at any rate, I, I thought it was, it was a pretty nice display, except when I looked at the Little Dipper, I saw there was one star missing. I said, how come? Well, NASA specified, we'll put all stars into magnitude 5.0. Well, wouldn't you know, one star is 5.01. So naturally, they left it out. Well, I put it in. So then I put in the Pleiades, because I like them too. <laughs> And I wasn't completely satisfied with the, with the uh, steel ball bearings, so I had Aldebaran and Antares gold plated. <laughs> so, you know, we try to inject a little amateur uh, fun activity uh, into this. Uh, this is the principle of how the uh, stars were generated. You have this ball bearing. Uh, with its focal plane matching the surface of the simulator and then when you shine a light on it you get an infinitely small star image uh, of a lamp and that is projected to infinity by the mirror and we actually use this test quite a bit at Teleview today in checking instruments to create by using artificial stars. Sorry, this is not a good picture, but it's the only one I had. This is a lunar map, a scale model in three-dimensional of the lunar landing surface. This is a structure that holds a device called an optical probe. An optical probe is a very fancy camera lens that will project with a Viticon the image to the TV set, transfer to the TV set so the astronaut will see it projected to the uh, 110 degrees. So one of the things I worked on at Ferrand were optical probes, and they were a lot of fun. Uh, this is an example of just a test model. Uh, this one happens to have a field of view of 140 degrees, and it had 45 lens elements in there. Part of this system gave me the idea of doing the Nagler eyepiece. So it kind of all comes around. In fact, uh, that's, that's just a simple schematic. It uses lenses that tilt and all kinds of complexity. I won't go into much of that. Uh, this is, I don't know if any of you can see it, but these are the actual 45 lens elements in this silly thing. This, I think, cost about $150,000 to build. Later on, I left for Rand. Left for Rand, got a job with the Keystone Camera Company where I was, where I was arguing with the management about the difference in cost between an 80 cent plastic lens and a dollar glass lens. So, talking about going from one extreme to the other. Uh, that is the objective of the optical probe. And you can see that the trick is that prisms to move around pitch roll and yaw, that means the exit pupil is out here. So you had an external exit pupil, you had a 90 degree field of view in this case, and you had collimator or telecentric light coming out the back. And my God, that's kind of the description of an eyepiece. So I said, well, gee, if we can do that, 
uh, in the space program, wouldn't I like to have one of those in my telescope? So uh, the trick is, if I can make something that somebody else will buy that I can have, that's okay. That's the, that's the rationale. This is the optical probe, and to test the optical probe, um, I built a model of a runway because they also use this for uh, simulation for training pilots, and this was all before computer image uh, generation. This was in the, in the mid-60s. Here's a picture through the probe to give you an idea of what it could do. That's a number six screw on the side of this one-inch wide uh, runway with uh, felt uh, blotting paper. As the, as the grass gives you an idea. The trick is a normal optical system has the focal plane perpendicular to the optical axis. But if you're landing on the moon and you're on the land, you're looking straight out. So you want the, the plane of surface, the uh, object surface, with, to be in focus even though the object surface is parallel to the optical axis not perpendicular. And that's where the trick came in with the 45 lenses. So there's an example if you use a normal system where the object is perpendicular to the optical axis and then if you tilt a whole bunch of lenses there's the same picture what, what you can get when you do the tilting and you can place the lens effectively a quarter of an inch from the surface. And that quarter of an inch translated to the 17 feet or so height from the window of the lens down to the lunar surface. So this is, this is how we did the, the simulation in principle. And I must say I had a chance to, uh, to view through the simulator. And if you ever want to get vertigo, you just look out that window and, and look at the, the lunar surface coming by you. That, that was really scary. The astronauts had a lot of fun with this too, with this simulator. They, 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 would, they would do wonderful things. Like the, the first time uh, Neil Armstrong went through a complete uh, simulation of this, some of, the, some of his buddy astronauts. Now, I, now get the picture. You see the size of this? You're looking at like an inch across here. And so you can imagine the scale, right, when they're getting down to the surface. Well, one of his buddies, had a workman tape a live praying mantis. <laughs> you can just begin to visualize at this scale what the landing site would have looked like. <laughs> and further, when they had visiting dignitaries, they took some liberties. When uh, President de Gaulle came, they put a little Eiffel Tower in the middle of the crater. <laughs> When Lady Bird Johnson came, they planted a tree, and you know, this kind of thing. So it, it was, there, there were some fun and games. Okay, let, let's go on just very briefly to the next uh, part of my talk, which is uh, talking about the viewing experiences and some of the things we're, we're doing. And we, we have to look at the viewing experience in a totality of both the, the starry night, what goes on with the atmosphere, the telescope, your eye, it's a continuum, and each of the parts have to be properly accomplished if you're going to get the most exciting result, what I like to call the spacewalk uh, experience. So you have your eyesight with all of these factors. Uh, notice the resolution of the eye at best is one arc a minute. You realize that what that means? People forget that. If it's one arc a minute, that means to see one arc second, you only need 60 power, theoretically. So think about that. For conflict, you go maybe three times that to 180 power, but you're not seeing any more than a, a comfortably when you go above 200, 250 power. So these are some of the factors we have to consider uh, for uh, relative to eyesight. Um, we need to look at things like the exit pupil, but in more recent years, I, I've concentrated because I found there's a lot of uh, uh, myths, and you can read my article on our website. Uh, by the way, how many of you have seen, seen our website, teleview.com? Great, great. Okay, uh, so look at the article on magnification. It covers all of the myths. But here, 
if this is the telescope objective, and there's the eyepiece, there's the exit pupil, that's the eye relief, this is the focal plane, the common focal plane between the objective and the eyepiece, and it's the diameter of that focal plane that determines the true field you see in space. That diameter divided by the focal length of the objective, that angle, gives you the true field in space. Nothing else is as accurate, nothing else counts, everything you've read is wrong. <laughs> and my conclusion of this article on magnification, I'd just like to share that with you because I occasionally get arguments on this and I like to beat people down with give me arguments. Um, so the bottom line for any telescope, the best low power view comes when you use the highest power that frames the subject. Why the highest power? This is myth about the seven millimeter exit pupil getting bright images, low power, blah, blah. Well, if you frame the subject, if you see the whole subject, and you have a higher power, you've got a smaller exit pupil, more magnification, darker sky background, better match to your eyesight, everything works. And that's why when I came out with the Nagler eyepiece, it just happened to coincide with the Dobsonian revolution, and it just really clicked that you could get those benefits by going to the higher power. So the deal is use the highest power in a low power system that frames the subject you want to see. Conversely, for the best high power view, use the lowest power that reveals the detail. Anything else you know is empty magnification and you've got problems with shaky mounds and the atmosphere and uh, uh, floaters in your eyes and so on. So uh, just keep that in mind and if anybody wants to argue with me about it, hey, it's history. <laughs> ten, ten years ago, I, I got convinced and nobody can convince me otherwise. <laughs> okay, so the bottom line for what you need in eyepieces to me is People don't believe me when I tell them you don't need a lot of eyepieces. Now, I'm happy when you buy them, but you don't really need them. You only need a few eyepieces. You need one to cover the widest field, and that goes by looking at the field stop size. You need one to cover the planetary magnification, which may be in the 150 to 250 range, depending upon the scope. And you might want one or two to fill in the middle ranges and fill them in in increments of field size. That is the key. There's no point of having two eyepieces of different magnifications that end up showing you the same field. That's just a total waste. I came to that conclusion when somebody in Amateur Astronomy magazine wrote an article saying a great set of eyepieces because of the exit pupils be a 40 teleview parcel, a 32 parcel, and a 22 panoptic. Great! Except they all show the same damn field. <laughs> so th this, this was the article the, uh, that didn't make any sense to me. And the last thing, and what I've come to realize, and a lot of things i come to realize because of my own failings, uh, I've got astigmatism. Now, what to do about astigmatism? Well, if you have a long eye relief eyepiece, in the, as in the past, I've made long eye relief eyepieces, you could always wear your eyeglasses. So, okay, fine, you wear your eyeglasses, but that can create some problems. So, recently we came up with a product called Dioptrix, which I hope we can fool around with uh, tonight after, after the session will be finished soon. And Dioptrix is like a prescription for the diop diopteral correction of astigmatism in your eye. So you don't need to wear eyeglasses. So, what does it do? It addresses the astigmatism in your vision and people have it varying orientations. If you look at your prescription, it has all kinds of angles on it. None of, none of that matters. Uh, astigmatism also changes with age. That does matter. Uh, however, you focus out far-sighted or near-sightedness with the telescope automatically. So you don't need the power correction in your glasses, you only need the astigmatism correction. So you cannot focus out astigmatism in the telescope. 
This is what a star image looks like as you focus through in the presence of astigmatism. Now, a lot of people have complained to me about how lousy our eyepieces are, and I say, no, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. Um, what eyepiece are you talking about? And they're usually a 55 plus or something. How big is your exit? Two plus, six, seven millimeters, whatever. Then do me a favor, just rotate your head around and see if the defect rotates with your head. Because invariably, that's the reason. But I hate to tell people they have to go see their eye doctor, but that's, that's the fact. You, we check every eyepiece 100% since I started the company, and I know you don't see astigmatism, at least in the center of the field. Okay, so the astigmatism is in the telescope, can be in the telescope, or it can be in your eyesight, it's not in the eyepiece. So here are some of the factors uh, that can cause problems because of eyeglasses. Uh, you don't need the correction for near or farsightedness, so you've got extra power and aberrations in your eyeglasses. Second, progressive lenses. How many here have progressive lenses? They are an abomination. <laughs> I'm sorry to tell you. I can't get used to them, but aside from that, imagine you're looking at an infinity field of view like the astronaut saw, and you want to have different focus in every part of the field of view. Try it. Doesn't work. Okay, so forget that. You can have bifocal, trifocal glasses. They reduce the vertical field capability for the same reason. Many eyeglasses have uncoated lenses, causing brightness and contrast loss. Some eyeglasses are plastic for safety, they're easily scratched, and frame styles may limit the fields and eye position, positions at the eyepiece. So I said, well, uh, okay, I've been on a quest before, I'm gonna do another one. I'm gonna find out what the story is with all of us related to how you can correct astigmatism, what people really require, what they don't require, regarding trying to correct the system without using eyeglasses. So, the bottom line is here, the Altrix is a multi-coated glass lens, pure astigmatism to correct, correction, just matching your eyeglasses, and it just so happens it fits on 21 models of Teleview eyepieces with long eye relief. So you have a nice range from 3 millimeters to 55 millimeters of eyepieces that the Dioptrix fits. So the benefit is you can not only choose the amount, the proper amount of astigmatism correction, but you also have the rotation capability to tune the axis. Now one of the things I was concerned about is how critical this would be. And I even put numbers around, letters around the side of our dioptrix because I thought that would aid people in finding the right spot. And uh, then I found out happily that it's very intuitive. It's very much like focusing to just rotate the eyepiece, uh, the dioptrix and focus out the astigmatism. So if you have your prescription looks like this, you'll see there are several sections of spherical, cylindrical, there's also one called axis. And OD means um, right eye because that's for dexterous people, and OS is for left eye because that's for sinister people. I, don't ask me. Uh, but anyway, you look at this number of cylindrical for your right eye and the cylindrical for your left eye, and that's all you need. If you happen to use a binder view like I do, well, you need two of them. That's all. So just use the cylindrical correction for your preferred observing eye. How do you install it? I'll show this to you uh, later, or just briefly as soon as we finish, but it just goes on top of the eyepiece and replaces the eye guard. Very simple. And you adjust it by using the television test chart. I put a television test chart up here that we can use tonight, uh, and I have a telescope, and we can actually uh, try it out. So we use a television test chart, uh, which comes along with the package when you buy a dioptric, or you can use a real star image, and you rotate the dioptric till you get the sharpest image, and you're done. Of course, you have to focus. So, here are some of my preliminary conclusions. I, I tested, uh, at this point, about 100 people, some of you I may have even tested it at one of these star parties. A Texas star party, Riverside and Cherry Springs. 
use me our Teleview 60 with a 32 millimeter plus and giving you a 5.3 millimeter exit pupil. And here are some of the things I've concluded. First, some of you are damn lucky. Second, some people don't like to wear glasses even when they have astigmatism, so this is really neat for you. Third, some people can detect as little as a quarter diopter astigmatism, which is the minimum amount. Uh, Sue French can do that. You, you probably know who Sue French is. Um, the, the rotation for line the axis is intuitive, like focusing. I haven't found any difference yet between day and night values. At least nobody's reported that to me. And eliminating astigmatism not only makes the star sharper, but allows you to see fainter stars. Now that's logical. If the image coalesces, it's getting brighter. It's like what we did with our coma corrector, the paracore. By shrinking the blurry star images at the edge of the field, tightening them, you get a tremendous increase in intensity and all the faint stars appear instead of blurring out at the edge of the field. In fact, um, yesterday I spoke to somebody who for a while I was mad at me, he bought a diopterics, he said, that damn thing doesn't work. I worked when you tested it, but it didn't work in the home. So we started talking a little bit, and I found out he was using a, a fast reflector without a paracore coma corrector. So it had all this coma at the edge of the field, and he was trying to get it out with the astigmatism correction in his eye. Uh, sorry, it doesn't work that way. So he got the paracore coma corrector, and bingo, I think he's happy now. Um, so we can also uh, correct more than two and a half diopters by stacking, although that's uh, kind of messy. And generally, diopterics has been considered better or equal than uh, to eyeglasses. In general, better. Here are some of the comments I got. I was writing down comments. People were looking at it. I got, I got my note here, you know, I'm looking at the telescope. And, you know, like yesterday, I was at uh, Skies Unlimited. And I uh, counted the uh, four wows. The fifth one doesn't count because I came from my daughter-in-law. But that, uh, but we, we got very nice, very nice reaction uh, from people with, with that. Um, lastly, just very briefly, we have this Teleview imaging system, which I'm using as a basis to show you the diopterics tonight. It's our Teleview 60 configured with a field flattener and two inch focuser so you can do nice nice imaging with a small 360 millimeter focal length lens and it includes our focus mate fine focuser and measuring capability to a ten thousandth of an inch i'll be happy to show you that here uh, my good friend jim burnell who's wrote the book handbook of astronomical imaging i think it's called it's just coming out the front cover of this new 100-page book has a picture of the Rosette Nebula on it, taken with the Teleview 60. That's his setup. He's got a Teleview 60, an NP-101, and a Vixen scope here on a big uh, Los Mondi mount. And he does some, some really neat work. His website is jburnell.com. This is a picture of the Macarian galaxy chain. Uh, Jim found a 19th magnitude galaxy in that picture from a sub suburban location outside New York City with this uh, instrument. And this is one of my favorites because that's M35. I love this little uh, cluster in here, NGC 2158. It is really a terrific cluster. And if you look at its website, you can really see the resolution and, and the imaging in that. Uh, so that, that's when I sat with him uh, that I wanted him to take, and I'm very pleased with the way that uh, came out. Uh, that, in, incidentally, is what television looks like, in case you're curious. That's where I work every day. It's two miles from my son's house and about 25 miles from my house. Until three years ago, it was just the opposite. It was 25 miles from his house and two miles from my house. So, you know, we kind of traded places a little bit. So that, that's where we work, and we do everything uh, in terms of all the mechanical work uh, locally through local machine shops. We put everything together, we do all the collimation, we test every eyepiece, and uh, we, we have a great bunch of people to work with. They all have a similar philosophy. Uh, do it right first, do no harm. And 
And that's the story of where this guy came from about uh, 50 years ago. Thank you very much. Gemini or Apollo simulators still exist? Parts of them have been sold for ridiculously low prices in garage sales. I, I have no idea who got, who got the parts and, and, and where. I'm just sorry I didn't think of it a long time ago. Okay. <laughs> yes? Uh, no, uh, I've heard about this. I know there was an article in Sky and Telescope where somebody applied one to our 20 neighbor about 10 years ago, and I've recently discovered, uh, and now research <laughs> looking into it, that uh, there was a major article by Roger Sinnott in 1976 in Sky and Telescope, and wouldn't you know, they found information going back to uh, Brashear who talked about this in 1889. So, you know, so it's, the concept is not new. Hopefully our, our implementation is new enough and accurate enough and helpful enough and we have enough product to go with it that will kind of change the dynamic because to me this is the missing link. We try very hard to do it with the telescope, right? The MPT. That's, I designed the MPT, the original Naval Petzval Telescope, because I needed a telescope to test the eye. This is one that was flat field, no central obscuration, really sharp, wide angle, and so on. And that's why I did that. So we, we've done the flat field telescopes. We've done the eyepieces. We've done the paracord to get rid of the coma. And as I've learned, sadly, the last thing you have that I know about <laughs> is the astigmatism in your eyes. And it seems to me that if we have the material to do it in a simple way, and we can do it in a simple way, reasonable, and at a reasonable cost, that why not? Let's do it. Yes? You, you, per, you might, yes, you probably could. Uh, be, if the bearing tube is a fixed type bearing tube and not the bearing tubes, it, the older ones rotated, all the new ones in the last 10, 15 years are all the three inch long bearing tubes solidly mounted. And as long as you have a solidly mounted bearing tube with an internal pinion, you should be able to do it. Yes, sir. As a matter of fact, a number of our eyepieces have fluoride substitute lenses in them. We just don't talk about it. We also have very high index lanthanum lenses, lots of them. We just don't talk about it. But we do what we need to do in order to get the job done. We just don't talk too much about that. <laughs> For obvious reasons, as, as you well know. Uh, my first uh, patent on the Nagler, the, if you look at the patent, it, the patent is called Ultra Wide Angle Eyepiece for 90 degrees. Yes? For uh, most of your career, you've worked uh, with systems where you're very far from the periaxial uh, approximation. And that's where uh, higher order aberrations right. really get angry. Right. Yeah, well, uh, this, I started out with uh, calculators, hand calculators, and so on, logarithms, and, and, and what are called Seidel aberrations, where you get approximations to the aberrations. When you get into stuff like this with large angles and fast systems, uh, you, you've got to worry about the higher order and all the higher order aberrations. It's, it's complex. Uh, thank goodness there are high-speed computers that do a lot of the work for us. And the optical design is still kind of a marriage between art and science. It's a little hard to describe. So I don't have an absolute answer for you on that. Do you think modern codes are adequate to that? 
modern. Oh yeah, yeah. No, the, the computers, uh, the programs. I use Zmax programs. It's a wonderful program. You can do lots and lots of great things. Uh, it's just you got to be smart enough. And I only read this little tiny portion of this big fat book so far. Uh, but uh, I read the portions that I need to do what I <laughs> what I'm doing now. Anyway. <clears throat> yes, sir. You mentioned the, the glasses and stuff that you use. Do you think there would be a day with your older designs that you would open source the designs, publish the publish the details of some of the designs? Sure. Go look at my Nagel patent. <laughs> yeah. Go go look at the book, um, a Telescope Optics by Van Rouge. Uh, he's got the patent in there, he shows all the uh, aberrations, compares it to Erfels. He's also got my fossil in there. He's got one of my um, pets fall uh, designs in there. So a lot of it is around my, my old white field. Even the fossil, I have the patent on the fossil for improved correction over astigmatism. So it's, just check the patent office. Yes, sir. Yeah, it just so happened, that's what I used. Yeah, the reason I ask is, I mean, uh, uh, stop me if I'm wrong, it's sort of common wisdom is that if you're mildly uh, astigmatic in your observing eye, that it's a much more noticeable problem with the larger the exit pupil. Absolutely, and, Ab absolutely. And, and uh, was that a, a consideration of, in the design of the object? Was it intended to be uh, uh, principally for uh, low power correction of astigmatism? No. No. In fact, uh, Stein Telescope uh, mentioned something, the recent issue about uh, our dioptrics, and they mentioned about it for low power. And I wrote them a nasty letter because I said, it's not low power, it, it has to do with exit pupil. It's for larger exit pupils. Now, I have one and three quarter diopters of astigmatism. I can detect the difference down to a one millimeter exit pupil. So you can, you can scale up or down from there. So as far as I'm concerned, uh, it's a do-no-harm system for almost any exit pupil. And I just don't know the answer as to, uh, like tonight, we'll look at this. We all have maybe three millimeter exit pupils. The setup I have here is a six millimeter pupil. You're not going to use the six millimeters. But presumably, if you see something at three millimeters, it's only going to get more important and better if you use it to correct at six millimeters in terms of your eye people. Follow-up question, uh, number of optical elements in the device. In the dioptrics? Yes. One. It has no power, it's just the stigmatism correction, it has very careful mild curvature and multicolored and so on, that's it. Again, do no harm if at all possible and that's a, use the simplest approach. Yeah, yes, sir. Well, one of my competitors came over to me one day and said, you know, Al, I have a mirror that's a little astigmatic, you know? Go buy one and play, you know, be my guest. Uh, yes. Yeah, but last thing I want to do is market it for that purpose, but, you know, it's available. Yes, sir. Have you ever considered getting into binoculars? Yes. And the answer is no. <laughs> Binoculars are nasty things. I decided a long time ago that the bino view approach, the binocular viewer approach, made a lot more sense. Where you split up the uh, the beam into two eyes, and my God, a single 20-inch telescope is a lot easier than two 16-inch telescopes put together with all the finagling. Pardon the use of that word. Uh, to, to get all the, all the parts together and aligned and so on. It makes no sense to me. So to me, the bino view way is, is the way to go. And uh, by the way, quick, quick aside on bino view, I'll let you in on something. I, I haven't seen it in the literature any place, but I'm convinced of it. How many of you have bino viewers or have used bino viewers? Okay. Would you all agree that you look at the moon or something, you look at deep sky, whatever, it looks 3D, doesn't it? It looks 3D. It's not 3D. It's the same image coming through both eyes. We know it's not 3D, but it looks 3D. 
Well, I found out the answer because I did a little survey among people. The focal plane is where the image and the field stop coincide in an eyepiece. You've got the black circle that defines the edge of the field, and at the same place you have the image, so that the eye is seeing the image and the field stop, right? Fine. But the brain does something magical. The brain says, that field stop is a window two feet in front of my face, and I like it there, and everything else is outside. <laughs> and take, a, take notice of that next time you use it. And that's one of the things that gives you that tremendous feel of three-dimensionality. Yes, sir? You offer uh, increments of like a quarter diopter. Quarter diopter from quarter diopter up to two and a half at present. Uh, I'm learning that some people have more, so we may offer more uh, in the future. Yes? Um, what does it do to eye relief for your eye? Knocks out know? about eight, nine millimeters. Of course, you take off your glasses. So there you go. Now if you start with a 20 millimeter eye relief on an eyepiece, you knock out nine, you're left with 11, nice and comfortable. You will see. Anybody else? Yes. Uh, no, not not generally. We don't have a showroom. We have a bunch of guys sitting, putting telescopes together and checking eyepieces and stuff like that. It's not like a, a manufacturing facility. We control everything at the output end, but it's not like a place where you're going to see real uh, a basic manufacturing done. By the way, all, all of our optics are made basically in uh, eyepieces in Taiwan and Japan, people who ask that question, um, and objectives mainly in Japan. Nothing is made in China, and the factories that make, it, make our products make them only for us, and we have 15 and 20 year relationships with them, so it's a very smooth operation, and we, we, we don't go looking for price, we look for quality. Yes, sir. Uh, what type of lens is your dioptrics? Is it a men meniscus or? Yeah, it's a mild meniscus. Yes, sir. Uh, can I, Mr. Nagel, what's the best rule of thumb as far as cleaning eyepieces for the jet phone telescope? Oh, boy. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, well go, go to our website. But uh, what we do is we use acetone, and we use we put acetone on a Q-tip an, for an eyepiece. Just go in circular motion from center to edge, and just as you finish, breathe on it. If you happen to have a slug of vodka first, it's even better. And then, and then you take another Q-tip and finish the job. Really, my question is, there's a lot of amateurs, I've done a lot of amateurs, just go overboard as far as cleaning because yeah, so, I never clean mine. Well, some people do, do go overboard, and that's one reason why we don't recommend specific cleaning methods or products. We try something. Um, the, called the lens pen. We don't like it because it can pick up dirt and scratch the lenses and so on. If you go to your drugstore and buy a rectal syringe, a big blue syringe, and use that as a puffer, we use that all the time, and first blow off everything off the lens, and then use the other techniques I suggested, you'll be okay. We have eyepieces 20, 20 years old that, that still look great. Any other questions? One more. One more. Uh, what kind of, com you talked about uh, fast computers. Do you use uh, modern desktops or workstations? Yeah, modern des desktop is fine. Sure. Okay, two, a couple, me couple gigahertz is enough. Yeah, to do sure. Now, where else could you go and hear about the space program and astronomical use for rectal syringes? <laughs> 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 and everything else in between. What a wonderful talk. Thank you. prototype for the 13 Nagler. Oh. I'd like to see that. For t this is a 25-year anniversary wow. of, the, uh, of the Nagler. Oh, and, uh, I thought Cohen did his hands on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
that body count is probably tried for over the years, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> no sale. Okay, so if, if anybody would like to uh, try the di dioptrics or add, ask me any other questions personally or play with our new little focus mate that I'm very uh, proud of because it took a lot of work because I, I don't know anything about this mechanical stuff where you combine infin infinite friction and no friction in, in the same uh, uh, in the same part. It kind of blows me away, but we managed to come close. Well, this may be your chance of a lifetime, folks. It certainly has been a chance of a lifetime for Novak. Uh, it's our 25th anniversary. You probably have all kinds of goodies, but I hope you'll accept this one oh, from us wonderful. as well. Uh, our first multi-day star party that the club and the Virginia Opera Lighting Task Force put on. Uh, where that can help. Great. Thank you very much. <laughs> down here for those of you with astigmatism and without. For those of you who uh, still want to visit, you can do that. Uh, Dr. Geller is going to let us keep the auditorium for a little longer tonight, so please come take advantage of your opportunity and safe home. There's still candy in the back. I'll tell you what, let's see.